Hi and welcome to another lecture on wealth calculation. Today I'm going to compare simulation results to calculation results based on theory. So far we took a look into different ways that we can solve the problem of singularities, which was the mesh bounding using mesh bounding like this, or using a chamfer or a fillet like the way the uh, fillet belt is or ignoring the other steps. But before that, let's take another look into wealth terminology again. The most important parts that I'm going to use in uh, this lecture are the toe locations, which you can see in this picture, and also the throat of the belt, meaning the theoretical throat of the belt which we use for calculating the effective area or resisting area against the load. So the stress is defined by the load divided by the effective area, which is the area being defined by using the throat shown in this picture. But this is only valid in the static load. And we're going to see that in dynamic load, we're going to have a different story. In dynamic load, uh, the failure happens due to crack propagation, and it will happen around the toe. So we are interested in the stress around the toe, while in a static load, we are interested in the stress on this specific plane or effective area. So I have a simple example with the um, theoretical solution and I'm going to simulate it and compare the result based on different methods and I'm going to explain different methods as we move on. So I'm going to go to the modeling first then model these parts and then I will jump to the three parts for simulation. So here on NX I first need to make an assembly. And I will add uh, two plates. Basically, we only need one plate. So because then we can duplicate it and use it again. But before doing that, let me add some sketch. Size is 100 by 100, and we need to extrude it for 6 millimeters. That's a correct. And we have the first plate here. <coughs> and uh, we can go back to the assembly level and copy and paste this. Now we have two plates, and we can unpack it. And then move the other one around to be a specific location. So to model the weld, uh, you can use the tamper uh, around between these two plates or you can just use this weld assistant if you right click on the top ribbon and check the weld assistant this new ribbon will open and you can select fill it add fill it well to your model now uh for the first one i'll select this as first and this one as second you can see that the triangle represents how it will look like and I'm going to specify the throat in the example here. I use the leg size as six. So I'm going to do the same thing. So I select 
puts the final leg down and it's safe. So we'll gap by the throw and put our arm around it. And we can go back. The second one. And it will be like this. So I save the model and we can now jump into the simulation. But before that, let's take a look at the uh, theoretical analysis for the aesthetic load. As you can see, I have a general loading on the top, 200 newtons on all directions. So it will generate a moment around y-axis, y-axis being the green axis, and around x-axis, and two shear forces around x and y, and a normal force upward. To add them together, uh, to calculate them, I will use the weld section because there is no connection between two plates except along the weld. I don't have any force being transferred from this plate to the other one directly. So the only resisting areas are these two red sections of the weld. So that's why I'm using these red sections for calculation of IY and IX, which are the second moment of area around Y, and the second moment of area around X. Also, the effective area is being calculated based on two 6 by 100 faces along the throwout. So, uh, same as for the normal along Z uh, stress. That will result in this kind of stress distribution. You see the corresponding stress in the same color. So due to the uh, bending around Y axis, which this force is responsible for, we're going to have this green stresses which is 3.8 megapascal. It's upward on the left side and downward on the right side of the plate. Then uh, we have this blue one, which is the bending around X axis, which this force is responsible for. And that is represented by these blue arrows and on these side, on two sides. And the line, green line and blue line in between represents the distribution of the stress because of the moment. And for the rest, we have shear and normal force. Now, I don't want to calculate the stresses on all points all around the plates because it takes a lot of time. But I'm only interested to find the critical and I think six points are enough to find the critical point. As you can see, here it seems that we have the critical point because I have a 3.8 megapascal upward, and then I have one megapascal again upward, and then normal Z upward, so they add together. And the shear force is same for all points. So can't forget about the shear force for now and focus on the normal force. Here I have one megapascal minus uh, plus 0.23, and here I have 3.8 being subtracted from 0.23, and there is no blue arrow because the moment around x is zero. The stress due to moment. So as you can see, based on this figure. This point at the uh, top left is the critical point. And we're going to compare the result at this point with the simulation result at this point. Now, we need to combine these stresses, the shear stresses and normal stresses. And I use Vomesis criteria because the NX is also using Vomesis. And as you can see here, 
the combination uh, in combining these stresses, you need to pay attention that here sigma x, even though I seem to have a uh, normal stress along z axis, sigma x is actually zero because even though this is like along x axis, but it is shear type of stress. It's not normal stress. So that's why sigma x is zero. Same with sigma y. I don't have any normal stress along y axis. These orange ones are all shear stresses. So sigma y is also zero. The only normal stress I have in this simulation is the upward normal stress along z. And I add up all three of them here and here. Also, the shear stresses appear here. I don't have any shear stress along Z axis. These vectors on Z axis is, are the uh, normal stresses. So that's why this term is here, which results in around 5 megapascal. Now let's compare that to the simulation. The first type I'm going to use is a chamfer rod, which are a, a single body with chamfer rod. So I'm going to unite everything into a single body and then I will take that into simulation and find the stress on the same place as I do in calculations. So here I first need to combine all the bases. This combining should happen on the assembly level, top level of assembly in your master plan. So you can come back and remove it if you wanted to. But as you can see, I can't select these two plates. I can only select welds because only welds are at the assembly level. Here you can see on the assembly level that I have the welds here. But the plates are not on this level. To take them on that level, you need to promote parts that you need to be on the assembly level. So you go to insert and associative copy and you say promote body. I promote these two bodies and they will now appear here. And the master parts are hidden now. So they don't see them if I hide these ones. Now I can unite them. See the result, and this is ready to be taken into the simulation. I click OK and let's go to the depot. But uh, before that, let me let me just go back and assign a material. the parts here in tools assign material then go with the this will assign to the part in the assembly but you could select the new objects and assign material separately so I will assign to this united solid and then I go back to pre-post you can also assign the material in the pre-post that will override I don't need to change the geometry or idealize it, so I just jump directly into Planet Element Simulation. The options are okay. I don't need idealized part. I want the visible part to appear in the simulation. Sim Center, NAS, Strand, or NX Design Simulation, both are okay, and I want structure of simulation. Here I want to do linear aesthetics, so solution 101, global constraint is okay. We don't need to change it here. And I create a solution. Also, options here are okay. 
So I go to the simulation and will jump to the film part, which is ready for meshing. So I start to mesh the part and I will use 3D swept because I want to use hex mesh because there is no hole or a circular shape in my model and we don't need to use uh, tetrahedrons here. I want to mesh from this face to this face and one millimeter is in the So this is a mesh and it gives me enough elements on the rope to probe and pick up and read the stress. So that seems okay. I don't think we have anything else to do here, so I can activate the simulation and start loading. I want to add a force load on this face. 200 minus 200, 300. And you see the resultant forces on that face, which matches the problem we have here. Moving on to the constraint, I just want to fix both ends of the base plate and now all the nodes on the ends are fixed. We don't have any other things to do so I save and solve the problem. The simulation is finished and uh, the only Warning I had was to turn on the uh, element iterative solver in the solution because most of the elements are three elements. So I'll just go back and turn it on and run the simulation again. That Simulation is finished now, and let me move on to the results here. Let's take a look at the no low stress on what this is. So, as the calculation shows, this, this point here has the maximum stress of around 5 megapascal which is the point around here and to check the effective area that we are looking for i'm going to turn off the deformation and read the result on So I also want to pick like a face, effective face that matches the calculation. Somehow looks like this, and the calculation is 5.4. So I made an Excel sheet to compare the result. This is. 0.06 and 5.4. You can also find the difference in here in Excel. And I can show it in Excel. So we have 6% difference between the simulation and the theory. And as you can see, simulation gives higher or safer results compared to the theory. But I think if you go with a finer mesh, there you can 
have a better fit that matches the area, effective area that we use, and you're gonna get a better result for the effective area. So let's move on to the next methods that we use. The next methods that I'm gonna use for simulating routes are for dynamic load because static load actually never happens in reality. You never get a perfect static load. Loadings are always changing, but depending of the depending on the change on the load, you're gonna have a different result. So the dynamic load, or cyclic load, causes the crack into your structure, and the failure happens because of the crack propagation. As a result, there is a method that looks into the uh, stress around the toe, because the experiments show that the crack starts around the toe, that's why we need to look into the crack propagation around the toe. To find the stress here, one method is just to go back here and read the stress on this point, which I also have that here. So that method is chamfer method. This my single body with chamfer one. But instead of reading this phase, we are interested in the stress right here on the toe. So let's read that. This is the nodal stress. It's 24.9. Chamfer. But we need a reference or a theory that gives us the right number for the toe stress. So that method is called hot spot method. In hot spot method, we are going to assume that the distribution of the stress can be extrapolated linearly to find the stress around the toe. You can see here in this black line, it presents the nominal stress on the weld and on the parent uh, material. You can see as we reach the uh, weld, the stress goes up. Some numbers called notch stress around the notch of the toe. This stress is not a good pick to be used in calculation because this is the stress around here around the notch is really high and this will crack anyway so as the crack starts this stress drops down and it will crack anyway so remember that you're not interested in uh, initiation of the cracks but you want to control the crack so if I go with the notch stress I'm going to have a huge weld size because there is a huge stress here. And that will crack anyway too. So notch stress gives me wrong answers for calculating weld. But based on experiment, if I calculate the stress or read the stress from finite element method, on 1.5t and 0.5t, and then extrapolate that, a point around uh, the toe linearly, that will give me the valid stress to be used in calculations of the failure curve, which T here is the thickness of the thinnest plane. So I'm going to use this method and find the reference values that we're going to use for comparing to the other method. Going back here, so 0.5t, I have 6 millimeters, so I need to measure on 3 millimeters. 
and nine millimeters. So first one here, two millimeters is going to be, so we have uh, one millimeter per uh, element. So the third element is going to give me The result of point A. So this is going to be point A. As you can see, this is a this is the equation of a line. This is the, uh, the slope of the line, and sigma b is y intercept. And what sigma b on point B is going to be on Nine millimeters or nine element. Nine is here. So sixteen fifty-five. Minus. So this is my reference value. This is the real value that you need to use in calculations. Now the problem is that if you want to calculate the width like this, like the auto spot method, it takes a lot of time. If you have a complicated width or complicated structure, you have to go around, read the uh, stresses on half a T and, and 1.5 T, on all critical points and then check that against the resultant, uh, check that against the permissible stresses. And remember that we cannot use the maximum stress. This stress, 30, uh, 38, is not right. This is due to singularity. I can't use that as design stress. It's a safe or unsafe. So that's why we are trying to read the stress somewhere else that makes more sense and that gives some results uh, near the uh, realistic result. So that's why I'm doing this method. So the chamfer gives somehow good results, reasonable results. And the selection of these methods depends on how big is the structure and how fast is the software doing different methods. I'm moving to the next one, which is using a fillet here. To change the chamfer to a fillet, I need to go back to the modeling. But before that, I need to go around to this and here now. Here we can go to the fillet and edit this to a concave shape. Well, this can't trim the faces, so I think I'm going to Let's try the other one. This one is working, so I'm going to just make a connect blend manually. And this edge is going to make sure that they are the same size and so we have two fillets instead of the chamfer, so I can go back to the application, because here we get a warning that things are changed, and that's why I have this update button here, click update, and can't find the faces that we had before, so I need to match again. Here we go, insert match again. Now from here to this point, one millimeter. Okay. 
Mesh looks good. Let's go to the simulation file and loading is okay and the constraints are okay because we didn't change these two faces. And I can start the source. Now the simulation is finished, then I can move to the results on not all the misses, the stresses. Looking into stress and this one. Now let's see. Let me turn up the information and this seems to be the toe, which is twenty four point five Pascal. a bit lower result which is closer to the other spot method. Now let's go back to the final method. Let me save this and return to the model. So we did this single body with chamfer and single body with fillet and now we want to have only the plates without any build simulation. And then we will just bond them together by using mesh bonding or mesh mating. So first I need to go back and remove the rows. Let me go to the modeling and I can just remove everything we did on the assembly level and Meaning is going to be only two plates. Save here and go back to the view post. Move to the fem file and plate. So here I need to do the mesh again. I try to maintain the mesh size had in other simulations so it's going to work so I go with the one millimeter again okay uh, it seems that uh, the mesh elements are aligned this is just a coincidence but if the sizes are different you see that they won't be aligned because the meshes are not connected. Now to connect these two meshes, I'm going to use mesh mating that will automatically detect the coinciding uh, faces and it will glue them together. You can also use non-coincidental uh, faces and glue them together, but here I know these two are coincident at this or at this phase, so I use this. The search distance is okay, we are touching, so there is no distance. I just need to select all faces, there is no other face, uh, no other two faces touching in this spot. And click OK. Check the report, you see that it glued, it found two cases, the two faces, and glued them together. So now these two are connected. And I can update because we, need, we see an update waiting. If you update, they were aligning before, but now they will be connected. If they weren't aligning, after updating, they will align together. These lines of the elements will align. So they share nodes. And those nodes are going to. Let me save here and check if going back to the simulation file, I can check if the loads and constraints are okay. So I can start. So, so here you see I get an error that is related to the material. I didn't assign material to the plates separately. So I need to go back and first I need to go to the FIM 
file that contains the solids and from here I can assign the material also the solid floor. Active simulation for and quick sort. Okay, let's see the results. Let's go to a stress commit level of stress. And again here if you are interested in the stresses and this one. Let me Turn off the information and now we can fit the stress on the toe, which is at this point. So you see that bombing gives the same result as the chamfer with uh, less meshing and takes less time. And uh, if we fit it at this point, we get lower and if we want to read uh, the maximum we get 51 okay let's conclude here first of all the static results are around four to five times less than the dynamic results so if you design based on a static results it will give you an underestimate of a belt size so you need to be careful and make sure if there is any aesthetic any dynamic or cyclic load in your structure or not when you have a cyclic load let me add the differences here all methods are reasonably good and around the reference method it difference is around six to seven percent but the bounding method uses less computation power since we are not modeling the well itself but the fillet well gives the most accurate result but of course it takes more time and it needs more computational power 